Good evening and thanks for joining us for a new season of Sagas. I'm Sophie Sparks. Sagas is a news magazine that features stories about Seaman High School and the community. Each episode is centered around a theme. The theme for this episode is dark, which can have various meanings. Today we'll cover a serious injury that is plaguing our athletes, a dark subject that needs to be talked about, equipment that's in its darkest days here at the high school, the tragic story of a prize-winning duck, and a creature that may be lurking the streets of our community. Concussion awareness is a very important topic right now. For our first story, we focus on how Seaman High School treats athletes with this serious injury. The main problem that I have uh, had from my concussion is the fact that my memory has been very, my short-term memory has been very bad, but my long-term memory is like, I'll remember random things from a long time or from a long time ago that I shouldn't remember that's not really important, but I do. Well, the treatment of concussions really, once they have a concussion, is mental and physical rest. I really can't do anything because I can't work as hard because I have to remember what I'm supposed to do, which is difficult to remember, obviously. School's hard because I can't remember any of the stuff that I'm being taught. Um, I can't do sports because I don't want my head to get any worse, and I really can't do anything at home besides just sit with my family, which is fine, but I would rather do other things than that all the time. Um, they have to go through the return to play process where they have to be symptom free, and then uh, they see the trainer and she puts them through the return to play. We have a couple different ways that we diagnose concussions. One of those is called the SCAT-5. Um, that's a test that we do um, that looks at immediate memory. Um, we, they have to do some orientation uh, questions. They have to repeat some more uh, numbers in reverse order for us just to kind of give us an idea of uh, how the brain's functioning. It also contains a balance test. Um, so that's when we uh, diagnose a concussion along with 22 symptoms that they have to rate. Uh, and before they can actually come back, they have to be seen by a medical doctor and released for that. Um, long term, I also think some kids it affects um, in their ability to come back and play and be mentally ready to play um, so that they're not afraid to have contact and afraid to, to get that next concussion. I think since I play football, it's all about uh, knowing, it's honestly knowing the signs because like, I'm not going to sit here and say like I'm a professional at knowing signs, but when I, when I started to know the signs, I actually said something, but if something could have been done earlier in my opinion, I could have maybe sat out of practice instead of, I guess, continuously hitting. And it's also teaching people how to hit correctly and not lead with your head. The biggest thing we do is try to teach the proper way uh, to play the game, um, proper way to tackle, the proper way to hit people, um, and then hope that the players are able to, to put those into practice and um, that should help prevent them from being able to be, from being concussed. But there's not a whole lot we can do to treat concussions right now. Football is a game of contact and that's just something you can't take out of the game. It's just something that you can try and slow down. Concussions are serious and should be treated correctly. If you're an athlete, make sure you are informed on the symptoms and risks of a concussion and make sure you get help when you show these symptoms. September was Suicide Prevention Month, but that shouldn't stop us from presenting suicide year-round. We talked to a local mental health professional to learn about the warning signs of suicide and ways we can prevent it. Suicide. It's a horrible subject that continues to be more of an issue as the years go on. It is one of the leading causes of death in the world and could be affecting someone you know. Where you're from, what you look like, uh, gender, doesn't matter, anyone is um, um, affected by suicide. Rhonda Sparks is a social worker at a school here in Topeka. She deals with teens struggling with suicidal thoughts every day and wants everyone to be aware of the signs that someone dealing with these thoughts could be showing. There's no really one particular thing that indicates someone might be feeling suicidal, um, but what you really want to look for are changes in patterns of behavior of, of anyone, um, eating habits, sleeping habits, um, what kind of activities they uh, participate in, if they isolate a lot is, is an indicator, um, um, if their hygiene is really poor and they stop taking showers. Um, um, 
lots of tearfulness, looking depressed, um, just like I said, anything, any changes in just normal ways of behaving is what you look for. She also believes that with an increase in social media and technology usage, people are more likely to feel alone. When you spend more time on your phone and interacting on your phone, um, then with real people and um, being with people, it increases your um, isolation and, and your uh, vulnerability to suicidal ideation. The best thing we can do to help people struggling with suicide is to focus on prevention. Education is huge. Um, I know the schools, and especially the school I'm working in, um, they require all staff to be educated on signs to look for and what to do when you notice something. Um, education's huge. Um, you need to be in areas that have mental health centers, um, places that you can call um, should you feel um, suicidal or know someone that feels that way. Um, you need to have those services available. And it really doesn't matter who you talk to, um, the people you're comfortable with, you talk to them, your family, your friends, um, and then beyond that, then seek mental health professionals in your community. Suicide is a dark subject that no one wants to talk about, but talking about it is the best way to raise awareness. Through awareness and education, we can all work together to prevent suicide. If you have a friend that has talked to you about thoughts of suicide or self-harm, you need to tell a counselor, teacher, parent, or any trusted adult that will be able to get them help. Please do not hesitate to tell someone, even if that person doesn't want you to. It's better for them to be mad at you than it would be to lose a life. For our next story, we'll be covering a new meaning of dark. Family and consumer science is one of our school's pathways where students learn to read recipes and cook. Pathway programs are supposed to receive funding, However, the cooking classes have been left in the dark when it comes to upgrades for equipment. The Kansas Department of Education, along with Seaman High School, is devoted to giving students career experiences while in school. Seaman has created 26 pathways to offer students the most out of the classes students enroll in. The Perkins Grant is a federal mandate to fund career tech education courses. Um, and it's been around for a really long time. The state of Kansas is, is really embracing career tech education now as um, a renewed opportunity for students who may not be four-year college bound to have access to a high level of rigorous content in courses and access to real world on the job levels of equipment that you would see on the job. So that funding source pays for equipment materials and training for those teachers in those pathways, and we have 26 pathways. We also have career tech education funding, which is a separate pool that can fund other aspects of, of the course materials and training and instruction. The FACTS program is a category that should be funded under Perkins and CTE grants. However, it seems the program has not received equipment to keep the classes and ovens properly adequate. For one of the ovens, we have to preheat it anywhere from 25 to 50 degrees lower so it doesn't burn what it's using. Uh, some of them we have to cut down the cooking time. Some of them we just end up not even using the ovens and having kids double up and use the working ovens. If um, sometimes heating elements have gone out this year so far, things are over baking, lights are gone, um, you can't see to preheat. So for one of the kitchens, you literally have to like cup your hand to look to see um, what the like number says to know that you're preheating it to the right uh, temperature. We put in work orders every time there's something that goes wrong with them and then we get them like we'll ask once they're finally like kaput kaput um, for them to be replaced and that's the only time that they do replace them. <laughs> Fax teachers have become frustrated due to the lack of funding for their program after they have made several requests to upgrade. So each of our pathways have sort of a lead instructor who, who kind of manages that pathway and communicates with me about um, the goals that they're setting for their pathway, for their growth. Um, their advisory board consists of people in the community who are serving in that profession and they come in twice a year and give our teachers, our instructors, some insight into what's really happening in the real world that we can um, duplicate here at school or, or prepare students to um, uh, pursue after high school and then they also put together their wish list which is the fun part of being a pathway instructor um, is you can think about what the industry is using and what you are using in your classroom 
and make a wish list of items that you would like to purchase with our Perkins funding or our Career Tech, our Career Tech Ed funding um, to get those into the classroom so that students can be using them. So the wish list is um, prioritized by what the advisory board is saying, hey, your students need this if they're going to be viable in the workplace someday. And then our pathway instructors put together the wish list and then we pull all of the pathway instructor wish lists together um, and then we look at how much funding we're going to get through Perkins and then we prioritize depending on you know who has the greatest need like uh, you know we need this now or we can't teach this class or hey it's been a while we could use some new stuff so we might rotate through pathways to see who needs more stuff and when they need it and how they're going to be using it successfully. So I've been here seven years and every year we have to do like a, I think it's a three or four year plan through Perkins and stuff. Um, it's been on there all seven years I've been there is to replace the cabinets. Uh, our cabinets, the handles and hinges don't stay on there anymore because they're so stripped. Um, our like drawers bottom out, we've had literally like kids will pull them out and everything will just fall out of them because they just don't stay attached to the base anymore. We send a lot down to the um, woodworking class uh, and they're kind enough to usually fix them for us. Um, and then the other thing we've talked about is trying to get the flooring done because if you look in there there's three different types of flooring. There's um, the original laminate which is like a orange black then there's like the white laminate and then there's carpet down the middle and so for it to really be sanitary for a foods class it all needs to be like a surface that can be swept and mopped and cleaned each night. Although the facts teachers have requested new equipment through wish lists, administration could not recall the department placing a request for new ovens but it has caught their attention that the culinary arts program is in need of a few upgrades. I've been in the classroom a couple times just to visit Ms. Fike and her classroom and see how she's doing and it has been suggested to me that we need to do some improvements there so I'm definitely dialed into that need and communicating with Mr. Monahan about how he wants to prioritize. I think we just keep maybe getting pushed to the back burner because even though they're breaking and falling apart um, they're still functional. It's a little frustrating with um, especially with the cabinet thing we've been pushing that and then even the ovens like because hopefully when they get out in the real world I mean it's good for them to learn to be adaptable because things do break inside your home but to learn on it would be um, nice for them to have consistency and know that I can read a recipe and follow it exactly I don't have to preheat my oven remember to preheat my oven 25 degrees less or I don't have to worry about trying to find certain utensils because the drawer is now gone and I don't know where anything is so it is it is frustrating to um, to not have the up-to-date stuff for them to use. The cooking classes teaches essentials for home economics but the teachers cannot teach their students if their ovens are continuing to go dark. Mrs. Welch has been the CTE and Perkins coordinator for two years now. During her time, she has not allocated any money to the FACS pathway. Switching to another topic, ducks swimming on top of a pond might seem like a harmless thing to most, but something menacing lurks below the surface. We took a closer look at a local family's year raising fowl. The sound of ducks quacking is a familiar sound for one local family. The Dean family has been raising ducks for the past eight years, but each year comes with its new challenges. My grandma sent me some baby ducks, four baby ducks, about eight years ago. Um, and so that's what got us started. We just started raising them and they got, eventually got older and then uh, left us. And then we, um, we got more the next year. We probably had about 30 ducks and about 40 chickens over the years. We always buy our ducks from a breeder. So we get them as chicks a few days old and take them home and raise them up to be friendlier with humans and then we release them. All of our ducks are free range and so they uh, have to fend for themselves and in the nature. Yeah we have two ducks left and they both were at the county fair. The Deans actually took three ducks to the county fair. One of these ducks, a Cayuga breed, plays very well in the show. This was one of our best ducks so far. It was a champion. Uh, the breed was a Cayuga. So Cayugas are completely black with a greenish iridescent. So they always judge really well because they're really pretty. The duck plays so well at the county fair that it had the opportunity to be shown at the state fair in September. But tragedy struck first. 
we were not able to because it died. We actually had to put it down ourselves because we have a snapping turtle and it bit out of its chest. I was actually over at a pond. Uh, we didn't actually see it. We just saw the duck lying down by the pond and we came over, we looked it over and it had a cut. But we know it's a snapping turtle because a snapping turtle, the bite just got clean through. It wasn't like jagged marks of a teeth or anything. I think she was probably the strong one, so she fought hardest and that's why she probably lost her life, protecting the other ducks. We found it pretty late at night, not like dark, but around this time. And so we took it inside, I looked it over, it was clean. I tried to pull out a few feathers that were stuck in and then we decided to see if there was any bird experts nearby. We found one, we talked to her, we brought her, the, our duck over to her, and she said that there was pretty much nothing we could do unless we wanted to play, pay a lot of money to go to a vet and try and stitch her up. In the end, the Dean family has moved on from this quacking of a tail and continue to love showing and raising ducks. Yeah, I think we all have enjoyed raising fowl, especially ducks. They're beautiful on the pond and they're friendly. They come up to you and uh, we feed them up the house and they'll go back to the pond and it uh, just adds to the natural feel around here. So. Coming this spring, new baby ducklings will be able to fill the void the turtle left in the Dean's world and give them another shot at the state fair in 2020. Now, the vicious animal in the Dean's story was a snapping turtle, but there is an animal lurking the streets of Topeka that prevents an even greater risk. That vicious creature is known as the Kansas Chupacabra. In our backyards lives an unimaginable horror. The beast is often referred to as the Kansas Chupacabra. Most people ignore the rumors, but one man chooses to believe. So this would have been, I believe, 2016. It was my last year at my previous school, and we were all in the staff room eating lunch, and our activities or our athletics director came in and told us that he had seen the Kansas Chupacabra on the property there. And uh, of course, like any sane and normal person, I thought he was full of it. And um, then he showed us the pictures, and I started to go, hmm, I don't know. This might be Mr. Dingus' first experience with the Kansas Chupacabra, but it definitely won't be the last. Yeah, so the second thing, the second experience was from our neighbor who had a cat, and they would leave cat food out for it, and they were accounting or, or sharing with people that the food had started to go missing on all the decks and in the neighborhood. And at first it was thought that it was maybe just another cat or something like that. But uh, then neighbors started to report that they were seeing the, the chupacabra in their backyards. And so the speculation around the neighborhood began to be about the idea that this was the, the chupacabra that was stealing all the pet foods. The Kansas chupacabra might not have eaten his neighbor's cat food. It might just have been something scarier. Again, first of all, you know, it seems like a joke at first, but uh, when you come to realize that people are serious about seeing this, um, you start to get a little more nervous about it. Um, and then, of course, we did see it. So hearing it secondhand and even seeing pictures on people's phone isn't quite the same as when you see it yourself. So the third encounter that I had with Kansas Chupacabra was that my wife and I had been downtown at the Capitol with our kids. So we had done that and they had packed up the farmer's market and we were just kind of horsing around downtown. And we came back to the Capitol to go to our car. And when we came around onto the South Lawn, well, there was the Kansas Chupacabra right there crossing the lawn of the Capitol. So when you actually see it, um, well, I'd like to say that it was like, took my breath away or scared me, but my, my real impression was uh, that it was, it was smaller than what you get from people when it's a secondhand account. Mr. Dingus's expectations of the famed beast might have let him down, but that doesn't mean you can't look for the beast yourself. Well, I think my number one tip is you have to believe. That's the most important thing. You gotta believe in the Ch Kansas Chupacabra. You're never gonna see it. It's an elusive beast. Okay, 
it feeds off your desire. So the more you want to see it, the more likely it is that you're gonna see it. And there's some people out there, some, who claim that Kansas Chupacabra is actually just a mangy coyote that has lost all its fur and is just wandering around the city. But, uh, well, to those people I say, well, what fun is that? We might never know what really goes bump in the night, but if you happen to see the Kansas Chupacabra out there in the wild, make sure you be careful. Mangy or not, it's still a wild animal. Well, we certainly covered many meanings of dark on this episode. Make sure to join us next month for new stories with new themes. Thank you for watching.